Okay. Well, good, good sound. All right. Well, thanks, everybody, for coming out tonight. Um, I want to bring up uh, Commissioner Banks and go ahead and do us the, um, I think we've got a, a flag back toward this way, toward the fields, and he'll do our uh, pledge and prayer for us. Thank you, Commissioner. Let's start with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight for this gathering, and we ask for your wisdom, Lord. We have so many citizens that are affected by the decisions that we have to make, and so we ask that we do, would do these things that benefit the most, Father. We ask you to bless this time, bless this community, Lord, knit hearts together through this time, and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for us. All right. Well, we'll go ahead and get started here. I've got a few people straggling in, but we've got to, I think pretty much everybody got, this is almost more for scribbling on the back if you've got questions or, you know, have some some things you want to get some additional clarification. So just so everybody knows, this is a council workshop, which means there's no um, audience participation, but if you want to stay around late, if somebody, you've got a question for one of the panelists, um, feel free to stay afterwards and see if you can ask their questions. But we're just, it will be the panelists and then the commissioners will be able to ask questions about, you know, what they presented to to the uh, the council. So we'll start out with the, the, uh, the HOA, Attorney Kurt Artiman, he's going to kind of give the kind of the 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 plan they have as for for as the land swap goes, and then we'll go to next will be I think David David Evans uh, representing the golf group and, and how they think this thing can work. Uh, third would be our our own attorney kind of laying out some of the things some of the challenges within the development that we want to try to get cleaned up if we can if we can come to some kind of resolution. Uh, then we have the Esther group to talk about maybe a, a, some kind of an, a, a partnership with the HOA and a, and a golf group to run a, a golf course, if that's something you want to do. Um, we've also got, I, I know on the city website, all of the, the information will be here. Um, if you want to take a look, it's a lot. It's voluminous, eight, seven, 800 pages. Uh, the one I wasn't able to get uh, connection with was the FWC. I know there's some questions about the Turtle Preserve. I'll, you know, it's just they're they're out of Tallahassee. I couldn't get anybody to come down, and then and then couldn't get them to, on a Zoom call. So, if you've got questions, uh, uh, feel free to 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 uh, get with me afterwards. And if there's some questions you need answered, I'll I'll be happy to send an email up to Tallahassee to try to get those answers for you. So, with that, we will start out. Kurt Artiman. Thank you, Mayor. My name's Kurt Artiman. I'm with the Fishback Dominic Law Firm, our special counsel to the Rock Springs Ridge HOA. Uh, we very much appreciate the city council uh, and the golf group uh, coming to this to this uh, workshop so we can talk about how best to uh, achieve our collective uh, objectives or objective. And um, the IT guys said I needed to put it right up close. So if you can't hear me in the back, please just raise your hand and I'll try to speak a little louder. Anyway, we very much appreciate the city council coming to this workshop to talk about ways that the HOA can ultimately obtain ownership of the approximately 319-acre golf course in Rock Springs Ridge. The HOA, its board, and the residents have been uh, working on this. Uh, we've gone to the mat. You all, as a city council, have heard uh, numerous comments by residents and others. Uh, I attended one of your uh, meetings and, and made a few uh, points. The golf group has presented some information. So we are, we are here to try to uh, achieve the objective of the HOA acquiring the 319 acres that is now owned by the golf group. That's, a, that's the informal reference. Um, David Evans, the engineer, is right here for the golf group. Tucker Bird, the golf group's attorney, is here. We have a number of board members from the HOA present as well. But what I had presented at the city council meeting a number of weeks ago was the proposal along with the golf group's uh, assent to that was a three-way, um, uh, basically a three-way agreement. We call it a three-party agreement, which would involve the city of Apopka, the golf group, and the HOA. And in that, what, what would happen is that the HOA would pay to the city commission 
uh, a sum of money. We did not specify that money, uh, but we said fair consideration. We would pay to the city of Apopka an amount of money in order to uh, allow the city to then convey the Harmon Road, approximately 32 acres, to the golf group. Simultaneously with the payment and the conveyance by the city of the Harmon Road parcels to the golf group, the golf group would then convey that 319-acre golf property to the HOA. So that agreement, um, which you should have received a copy of, I, I know it's been sent to the mayor, the city attorney, I think also uh, Michelle Chase, who's on the board of directors of the HOA, sent that. Also, if you don't have one, I have a copy of that agreement here with me today in hard copy as well as the uh, electronic company that Michelle say, uh, Chase sent to you. But bottom line is we did not specify an amount. We said fair consideration. We understand, although I have not seen, that the city has a, an appraisal for the Harmon Road property of two point, roughly $2.5 million. We are aware that there's been additional uh, letters of intent and proposed offers to the city uh, far in excess of that, somewhere in the neighborhood of $4.5 million and $6.5 million uh, as the highest one. And I know there's been discussions among the city commission um, and the staff and others about maybe the city commission putting, the uh, city council putting that Harmon Road property out, out to bid. Uh, we uh, on the HOA believe that that would make a, um, a, a perfect way to make this deal occur. And um, the, the preliminary discussions with some of the board of directors are that the, the HOA is willing to, to pay uh, more than the appraised amount by a substantial amount uh, if the city uh, council were to go along with a three-way swap. The golf group likes that idea a lot. Um, it makes it attractive to them. It's attractive to the HOA because that three-way swap is dependent upon the HOA being able to sell its 51-acre Kelly Park Road property um, to anybody. It doesn't really matter, uh, but that would require to, ge to generate the kind of money that would be needed to pay to the city for the Harmon Road property and provide the HOA with some funds to be able to, to deal with the issues on the 319-acre the golf course. Uh, it would, of course, require a comp plan change to the 51-acre Kelly Park Road property. It would require uh, probably some changes to the PUD uh, and, and the like. So we really like that. And we, as, as both the HOA uh, and the golf group really appreciate uh, the city being willing to talk about that. As a backup, if that is not feasible, uh, and as suggested at the council meeting, the golf group and the HOA are evaluating a, a direct swap, the 51-acre uh, Kelly Park Road property for the 319-acre golf course. Um, that is a possibility. Uh, uh, the engineer for the golf group, David Evans, and their lawyer, Tucker Bird, are here to talk about that as well. That's a possibility. However, we believe, again, that the three-way swap, the three-party agreement, um, is, is, a, is a more effective and better way for both the HOA and the golf group to make this happen because it would, we believe, provide some funds that the HOA could use to improve the uh, 319 acres. So that, that's where we are. And I, I do appreciate, those are, the two, those are the two concepts that we've got. Uh, again, I'm going to hand uh, these agreements over there just in case you don't have a copy of the three-party agreement. Uh, I'll hand that, hand that out to you so you have a hard copy just in case. But we're not wedded to those. Our objective, as I, I said at the beginning, is to, to find a way for the HOA to acquire the 319-acre golf course, which will allow that property to remain uh, undeveloped for residential purposes. And that was why I was hired by the HOA as their special counsel initially, to stop that development. The golf group, who was pushing for development on that property, has filed, did file an application, I think a second application here last year, to go forward with that. And your DRC, the city's DRC, uh, said it was defective. That, but if we're not able to come up with a deal, I would expect that the golf group is going to proceed with the development. And that is a completely inconsistent with what the HOA 
and the majority, the great majority of the Rock Springs residents want. We do not want that golf course to be developed. Uh, and the best way to ensure that it does not ever get developed for residential homes is for the HOA to own it. And that's why we're going to these extreme efforts and considering any, every way possible for the HOA to actually acquire that 319 acres. Anyway, that's, that's my, my con uh, thoughts. I'm happy to answer any questions, but my thought is you'll probably want to hear from the golf group first and then open it for discussions, Mayor. Okay, yeah, that, that, that'll work. Okay. David? Hey, good evening. My name is Tucker Bird. I'm the, uh, the attorney for the golf group. You know, it's, uh, I think it's fitting that um, Kurt Artem and I are sitting side by side because it indicates we've mended, I think, a lot of the friction that existed between the golf group and the HOA. Um, and and I, we've worked really hard to try to come up with a plan that's a win-win. In this case, uh, the original concept of a land swap involving the city would be a win-win-win. Everybody would come out on top. Uh, the golf group believes that the highest economic value for us would be to develop the golf course property, 319 acres. It's extremely valuable, but the golf group has indicated a real willingness to look at some, some alternatives, probably less economic for us, but quite frankly, something that would accommodate the wishes of the HOA uh, and the like. So uh, we worked hard to come up with an option. Of course, the immediate option was a three-way swap. All the golf group wants to do is, is, is to realize some portion of the economic value of its asset. And that's really it. We're not trying to put the dispossess the HOA or put the HOA out. At the same time, the, the golf group does have an asset that, is, that has value. Now, with the city's initial, the initial thought was that the city would be able to come up with a, with a property that we could acquire and develop and economically benefit from it. The alternative, of course, if that's not a viable option for any of the number of reasons, we have the, the, what we call the second swap, which would be a direct swap for the 51 acres that the HOA owns. And that would probably require some changes to the, as I said, Kurt said, to the comp plan and the PUD and would require some cooperation from the city. So. The, it, it may not look like much on the outside, but boy, there's been a lot of uh, progress made in dealing with um, these issues. Again, a true win-win-win for everybody. And uh, David Evans, who is our crack civil engineer, can talk a little bit about or add a little bit to any of the issues we think we may face in terms of doing a deal. But we certainly appreciate the mayor's efforts and the council's efforts in trying to come up with, with something so we can all get along. Because quite frankly, it benefits the city of Apopka overall if all three problems can be dealt with at once. So David, any couple comments you want to add in? Thank you, Tucker. David Evans, Evans Engineering, uh, Civil Engineering Planning. Uh, we've been working on the Rock Springs Ridge property for probably four years now overall. Uh, know a lot about it, understand uh, some of the, uh, the issues related to how this property was brought from the county to the city and the things that happened along that way. Um, certainly are uh, interested in working out something with the uh, HOA like uh, Tucker and Kurt both uh, discussed and, and described. But at the end of the day, what we did was obviously uh, we were in charge of making the uh, submittal to the county or to the city for the comp plan change. Um, we did that back uh, two years ago and then uh, had a second submittal. Um, we do have some comments on the table from the DRC and the staff members, and we'll certainly, uh, those are still pending, but obviously not interested in uh, going back into the city if we don't have to. Uh, we've looked at the Harmon Road properties, our favorite. Um, we enjoyed working with those. We've had a couple of uh, interested uh, parties in those parcels, and uh, we've found a way to kind of make those work. It's in a, in a viable area, uh, very uh, you know, adjacent to 429, good access. So uh, we were able to kind of do some exploration and some on utilities and storm waters and all the, you know, the stuff we do uh, and found out that those properties were a very viable option for, for, this, uh, for this trade. Um, at the same time, we did look at the 51 acres on the north end of Rock Springs Ridge. Obviously, it hasn't been developed yet, and there's uh, certain reasons why. But at the end of the day, um, it's certainly a viable option as well. We did some, uh, some layouts and some planning on that property and uh, came up with a, a plan kind of to, to go forward if needed on that property. Um, it is a little denser than what you see in Rock Springs, but uh, with the city's cooperation and uh, certainly have already had lots of cooperation with them so far relative to how these properties can be developed. 
um, that the, uh, there can be some changes to the overall PD, which allows some more density to be uh, allotted for the entire PD, um, which would help the 51 acres become uh, viable for a, a development. As you understand, the, the property was miscalculated way back as far as the area goes, so the, the actual number of units on the property are uh, at or equal to or, or less than what is allowed based on the one unit per acre criteria that was uh, approved by the county and the city back in the day. Uh, so at this point, they've, in order to make that work, in order to make the 51 acres work, some changes have to be made to the PD. We're all familiar with how that works. There's lots of people in the audience and some up here that understand uh, what, the, what that means to go through that process, and so we're, we're willing and able to do that too. So we've seen options on both the Harmon Road property and the 51 acres, uh, and the, you know, the Harmon Road, again, was the, the easiest one for us, but uh, at the end of the day, the 51 acres has some potential as well, and we're here to answer any questions related to things we do. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Okay, next up, Michael, kind of give us the kind of the, the city's perspective on zoning and, and, the, and the, uh, the deal that's in front of us. Okay, uh, <clears throat> to first clarify, I think uh, the HOA's council did bring up two options. Um, in our last meetings with the HOA, I believe the city's position is that it's going to be option two. Uh, the Harmon Road property is not openly on the market. And any, any swap, any purchase of the Harmon Road property is going to require the vote of the city council. And therefore, then, it's when the option B was discussed to provide for what there is, what, there, what would actually be a swap, which would be a swap of the golf course land for the 51-acre, I think it's Kelly Park Road property. The city would not be involved in that land swap. That is a private arm's length real estate transaction between two private entities. City would have no say, no approval authority. It's, that's a private transaction like um, two people buying a house. Then the, the impacts of developing the 51 acres as it, re, as it relates to the city. The city would entertain any application for redevelopment as it would entertain an application from any property owner within the city seeking to develop property. It would be a two-pronged review on the part of the city. The applicant would first have to come in to seek an amendment to the future land use map. The future land use map, which is dictated by the comprehensive plan, dictates what are the um, allowed, allowable densities on property. As currently approved, Rock Springs Ridge, the plan development, contains two separate future land use map designations. A Porsche, there is acreage within Rock Springs, which has a density of one unit per acre, which basically means if you have 20 acres, you're allowed to build 20 houses. Another portion of the development within the development boundaries has a density of two to one. That means that for every acre, you're allowed two houses. Therefore, if you have 10 acres, you are entitled to 20 houses. What that does not mean is that you get one acre per house. So you don't, if you have a one-to-one -one acreage on 10 acres, that doesn't mean you get 10 acre lots. The comprehensive plan actually encourages within the area north of, um, north of Ponkin, and we are adjacent to the Wakaiva um, study area. It requires that the highest allowable densities be two to one. So any development or redevelopment within the boundaries of Rock Springs is, will require a land use amendment to permit an allowable density, but it cannot go higher than two to one. So once the densities are done, and that is a, two, a uh, process which involves review by the city's development review committee, a recommendation of the development review committee goes to the planning commission. Planning commission hears the request at a public hearing. There, the planning commission issues a recommendation, which is then submitted to city council. City Council has a first public hearing on the amendment to the, to the land use map. Upon approval of, uh, at first, after the first reading, if the city approve, if the city votes to approve the amendment, the amendment is then, depending on the acreage and because of the total acreage on the site, it will cross a threshold with the state of Florida, that the application and request is then submitted to the Department of Economic Opportunity of the state of Florida for their review and is also reviewed by the regional planning agencies. I think the uh, East Coast Regional Planning Council has a comment, the water management districts have comments, and other state agencies 
um, have a time to provide for comments. Once the state has completed its review, the matter returns to the city council for what's called an implementation hearing or approval, uh, approval hearing. That is a second public hearing. Once that is approved, then the land use map designation is changed for however the application is presented. Right now I'm all speaking in, in uh, hypotheticals because we do not have an application to review for the, the change to the land use to, um, and densities. The second prong of any request to redevelop Rock Springs Ridge will then be an amendment to the plan development agreement. Rock Springs Ridge is governed by a plan development agreement, a plan development agreement that has been amended three times prior. The plan development agreement dictates the number of units that can be built based on the approved density and the acreage, and also any of those permitted uses, sun's down, and any of those other permitted uses that will be allowed. One of the things that was, that was discussed would be to finally, quote unquote, clean up what are misunderstandings, misapplications, and sometimes, unfortunately, misinformation relating to the, permittable, the permissible development within Rock Springs Ridge. Such an application to amend the PD agreement would then be able to clean up the designated densities and have them match with the approved um, lots and also accommodate any redevelopment that would be conducted on the 51-acre parcel. One of the things that has been proposed that could be reviewed by the city would be to actually change the land use designation for your golf course. Right now, as of today, and as since this has been approved, the golf course has a residential land use designation. So the acreage of the golf course counts towards a residential land use. If you remove the golf course from those calculations, so your plus minus 300 and so acres, then you would accordingly adjust the overall acreage less the 300 you remove with an overall density. One of the things that was also discussed is perhaps changing the overall density of the entire plan development to, to the two to one density which is the maximum density allowed in that area pursuant to our comp plan. Then you would then accommodate the existing lots plus any of the additional lots that would be contemplated for the 51 acres, and you would finally have then what would be the overall permissible lot number within the PD, less the acreage of the golf course, which it would be up to the applicant or the up to the association, because at this point the association would be a party to such an amendment, whether you wish to designate your golf course land as conservation land, as recreational land, or a portion, a small portion of it to be commercial. One of the issues that has come up with commercial is you would most likely need a commercial land use designation to accommodate your clubhouse and restaurant. Under the city's comprehensive plan for recreational land use, it does not necessarily permit the use that, um, for the restaurant or commercial use. Commercial recreation has to fall under a commercial land use uh, designation. But all of these are things that would be contemplated as an application that would be brought to the city. The city would review these in a public hearing. An amendment to the PD is done at the city level. It is actually the, it is an ordinance because what we're doing is amending the zoning designation of the property. Um, that would require two public hearings as well as review by the Planning Commission prior to that and review by the Development Review Committee. Um, but that would be a way to then um, finally designate what would be the allowable densities and the allowable development within the boundaries of the PD, including the 51 acres, and um, come up with a finished product at that point to accommodate development, redevelopment within the 51 acres and the existing development, as well as then preserving the golf course land with a land use designation that would be consistent with its use as a recreational area, either as recreation, which would permit a golf course, or portions as conservation. Conservation is what it, be, what it means, conservation. It is protected natural growth. You cannot build on conservation land. You cannot develop conservation land. No. Sorry, the 51 acres is currently has a residential land use designation. else.
Michael. Now that, that's the overview of what the city's involvement in this real estate transaction. And based on our final meeting, the city's position is that the city will undertake and review an application involving a private real estate transaction between the golf group and the HOA, which would be a swap of the golf course for the 51 acres. Okay. Um, we've got the, the, the Estler group is here, the golf group, but I think what we ought to do while, we've, while it's still fresh in everybody's mind with the, the speakers we've already had, why don't we open it up to city council um, members for any questions and just if you just say who you're who the question is is directed at, and we'll we'll get, try to get the answer for you. So, Commissioner Velasquez, you want to start it out for us? Well, first, I'm I'm surprised with the three party agreement because when I'm surprised with the three party agreement because when I spoke to the attorney yesterday, my understanding was that this was no longer being considered. Um, so I'm. At this point, I'm surprised that Mr. that the attorney Ardeman is still presenting this with the Harmon property. I was told that the HOA would be dealing directly with the golf group uh, regarding the Kelly Park 51 acres of the Tortoise Preserve. So, uh, Mr. Mayor, I'm I'm surprised and don't understand why this was given to us at this moment. I think you just heard from our attorney that that was not no, when we left the meeting that was not a part of the agreement. So, well, I I'm listening to him, but he hasn't made that clear. Yeah, he I mean, did. That was the first thing he said. Did you say that that this was not? Yeah, it was the first. It was the first thing I said that it was so, that option one was not an option on the table that we had agreed to okay. only consider in this point option two, which was the development of the 51 acres, and that the engineering for the golf group was going to come to see what can be done for that redevelopment and that the city's position and, and um, in any type of agreement, the city cannot and will not, but first will not, but also cannot statutorily and constitutionally, the city cannot agree to any type of zoning designations by contract. That is unconstitutional. Any type of changes to the PD, any type of changes to the conservation, to the um, comprehensive plan have to be presented at public hearing and then voted upon by the council. We cannot, the city cannot bind any type of agreement by contract. That's contract by zoning, which is illegal in the state of Florida. So our position coming out of that meeting was, if this is what you're gonna go, what you're gonna proceed forward with, um, we will evaluate any application just like we would, just like the city evaluates countless applications for redevelopment in the city as they have in the past and as they will do in the future. And such review will be done pursuant to the comprehensive plan and of the land development code for approval or disapproval by by this council. Okay. Mayor, would you like me to respond? Yeah, uh, thank you, Commissioner, for that question. And your attorney is absolutely correct. It is improper and illegal uh, for a city or a county to enter into a contract to zone or comprehensively change any property. And that's not what this three-party agreement contemplates. Uh, there's no requirement there. And, and we understand that the city attorney uh, and the mayor uh, do, don't, do not like that three-party agreement. They prefer the, the swap. But, but what we're, it's, not, it's not my decision. I don't think it's the mayor's or the city attorney's. It's the city commission, a city council's position. If the city council does not like the three-party agreement, the three-agreement, that's up to you all as we understand it. And so, so I've been asked to, to at least make that as an alternative, not to say, no, we're not going to do that. But it, if you all as a city council say no, we understand that. That's your option. It's, it's discretionary. It's not required. But that's one way and our preferred way. You heard from the golf group and from the HOA, we'd like to do that. If that does not work because the city council does not like that or does not want to do that, then... We've got the backup plan, the direct swap, the 51-acre piece for the 319-acre golf course, which Mike says uh, that th the city would not be involved in, in that, and he's correct with respect to the direct swap. However, that deal would never happen unless the city council and the city staff were involved to allow those changes that Mike talked about to happen. Also, I think if we got to either that or the three-party, either way, 
uh, the mayor has indicated that he would bring to the council some opportunities to assist the HOA in helping to fund pieces and parts of that overall deal. So those are two options. We're open to considering other options. But to take that three-party agreement off the table before the city council has the opportunity to say yes or no, we think would, would not be fair. And, and as we had promised, I promised to the council that I would submit that. And we did submit it and we, uh, to the mayor and to, to, the, to the city attorney. And, I've, and the, uh, Michelle Chase has submitted it. I've copied. So we've honored that requirement. You can certainly tell us no. No, we don't, we don't want to do that. You're going to put out the Harmon Road property uh, to the highest bidder or you'll sell it however you want to. You're not required to sell it to the highest bidder. But we think that the Harmon Road property, if, for example, if the HOA were to pay a $5 million price uh, and the, the city were to keep the tower, it, we understand would be about a $1.5 million savings to the city, so that would get you $6.5 million. So all of this would be subject to bo our board approval, but at least it's an option we would like to talk about. If you tell us no again, we understand that, but, but it, we don't want to take it off the table before you all have had, as the elected officials, the opportunity to tell us no. Or tell us yes, or yes but, or no but. Okay, so when you're speaking in referencing the city council, I just want to correct you that that also includes the mayor. He is part of the city council. Well, right now you just said that he is in agreement with your three-way party and that no, it will no, be No, ma'am, I did us. not say that. Okay. Well, at this point, I'm kind of confused because up until this workshop, I, I was told that this was strictly about uh, the 51 acres, and it was a swap. It was an agreement between the HOA and the golf group for this 51 acres. So I'm, I'm, I'm not too sure why this three-way agreement is coming back up again. It's an, it's an option we would like for you all to consider. It's an option that has been brought through the council meeting under the mayor's report for the last seven months. It has never been discussed. Never decided. That's why, that's why it's an option, I think. If you, if you tell us no, you tell us no, but we at least think you ought to consider it. It's, but telling you no would be a, a vote, and that's not the case right now. You can make individual comments and let us know your feelings about it. And I think that's vote. been obvious. Um, I've always felt that the Harmon property was a city asset that should have been put out to bid and not used as a private sale to a private equity group. I made that clear. And it wasn't about not owning the golf course. It was about the procedure or the process that when we want to be rid or have a surplus of city asset, which includes a property, it should be first considered surplus, then put out to bid. And that was all I wanted. It would have been a fair uh, process where other developers or buyers would have the same opportunity to buy the Harmon property. Yes, we have gotten a few letters of intent, uh, all the way up to 6.5 million. It sounds really enticing, let's sell it, but I still believe that the fair way is to make the Harmon property surplus property. We have no use for it if that's what the city decides but we do have a tower that sits on the property. It's still viable, it is used by our first responders, and it is still an important uh, property that we use. That's all I've ever said. So that's my opinion at this point. Commissioner, Commissioner Bankson? Okay, on uh, proposal number two, the swap between HOA and the golf group, you mentioned, uh, I can't remember if it was Tucker or who mentioned this, about uh, certain city concessions. Were you referring to the two-pronged approach, or was there some other concession that, that was intended there? I think, I think what that was referring to is, this is back, goes back to Errol. So, you know, the thing is, we have to, we look at Rock Springs Ridge. I always tell people, whatever we do for Rock Springs Ridge, we need to be consistent with what, Errol, you know, same, same situation we're in. One of the things we talked about is if, if Errol, and this was back to the Errol proposal, if Errol were to, to, to re, um, 
reinvigorate their golf course and get the clubhouse back up and running, we as a city would at least entertain the idea of a TIF, a tax incremental financing, mm -hmm. to give them five years' worth of taxes above. So let's just say, for instance, that, that we, we generate, I don't know what, what, what we generate taxes in, in Rock Springs Ridge. Let's just say it's $3 million uh, property taxes. Under a, a TIF, we would give for five, three to five years, we would give the HOA the incremental financing above that. So let's say it goes up 3%, so now it's another you know, $100,000, and then it would go up from there. We would give that for some period of time, obviously with, with council approval, and that would help them fund you know, to, to get the clubhouse up to full, you know, to full speed, to get things they need, to get the parking lot repaved, to do the things that they want to do. And then at the end of the three to five years, then we would collect those additional dollars. And, and, and the way I justify that is that we, if we increase the value of your properties by, by having, the, you know, a, a golf course, then it's easy for me to justify it to a, a person who doesn't live on the golf course. So that, if, if that, I think, was there anything else I was missing? Is that what we were talking about? Well, overall, um, in order for the second option to work, we'd have to have, 51 acres would have right. to be developable. Sure. So we'd have to come to the, the city right. so. to get the necessary. And, and really what I'm talking about are the necessary approvals, and the city attorney is absolutely correct. In order to, to make the adjustments to the 51 acres, you'd have to make adjustments to the overall PD. And so and I, what I would say overall is if the, if the 51 acres is not developable for any of a number of reasons, well, then obviously the swap doesn't work. Right. But uh, if, if we go the option two route, we're talking about obviously we need city approvals in order for everybody to make it work and I suspect that the HOA would probably need certain approvals with respect to now the 319 acres and and then of course on top of that there may be other um, grants what now we could see the city can't commit to it but uh, we think everybody what we would really be looking for is the city to understand that we're coming in and with approvals this works without approvals it doesn't work Simple. Yeah, we were talking about, you know, could we help them with some grants for, for, for a uh, playground or some, some amenities that, you know, obviously we can't, it, it's a public-private partnership, and we, we're happy to help where we can, but, you know, like the FERDAP grants are for strictly for governmental entities, not for, so it, th there'll be a limited number of grant opportunities, and I said, yeah, if we can help you with those, if, if you can figure out a way to make this some swap work or where not even a swap, whatever. If you could purchase, you know, if the HOA could purchase the property, then we, we will do what we can to help. You know, the other thing is the, the ponds that we've got. we got the reclaimed ponds in the back that haven't ever been used. And I know that at the time the golf course was operating, uh, their, their water bills were, you know, could, could be north of 300000 a year. So if they were able to use the, the stormwater that goes into those ponds for irrigation on the golf course, it would, it would lower the operating costs, which would help, the Esler group, if that, you know, if that's what they end up, you know, if we can, you know, obviously you got to purchase the property and then if you wanted, if they want to do an agreement with somebody like the Esler group, then that would give them, you know, trying to drive down those operating costs for the, for the, uh, the club. Okay. Well, uh, Tucker, you had answered what I was thinking that was what uh, the attorney was explaining to us. I I'm nervous at opening the PUD so that it doesn't open some avenue that ends up taking from the people. For me, the end goal is self-determination for the citizens here and protection of their assets, but it also has to be the win-win in that sense. So what's the best course of getting there? Uh, and, and clarification, Michael, for uh, the golf course, you said the golf course is uh, residential land use presently as well as the 51 acres? Right. The, entire, the entirety of the Rock Springs PD has two future land use map designations. One is the RE, residential estate, which is the one unit per acre. And then there's a portion of it that is RVLS, which is the residential very low density, um, which is the two to one. There is no separate land use designations within the boundaries of the PD for conservation, for recreation, for commercial. And so can you explain the protected tortoise refuge designation? That is not, that is not contemplated nor done pursuant to our comprehensive plan. Right. If there is a, that is subject to an e-conservation easement that was entered into by the original developers and the Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission, as well as DEP. Any changes to that conservation easement, any modifications to that is actually handled to the state and not to the city. The city has no say or jurisdiction over that matter. 
the any applicant, whether it be the HOA, whether it be the golf co the golf course uh, gr group, they would go to Tallahassee to the to the commission in order to do any modifications, um, to have the easement released, to have it modified. There are plenty of options. There are plenty of different scenarios. Um, we could be here for hours discussing potentially the possible scenarios, but that would be something that be entertained by the state and not by the city. And I think that explained it too, and the, I think a little bit of confusion there that it's an easement, but that doesn't change the land use. No, the, so land, the land use is established here. The easement is something the state has put, up, put upon that and would have to be approached by the group to see that change. Right, we're talking about two different things. One is residential densities, which is governed by our comprehensive plan. Then there is a constant. Mine's on. Just sure, just sure. HOA can still talk. Yeah, I'm out. Okay, great. <laughs> All right. So we're, let me get my train of thought again. So, um, yeah, they, they, these, are, these are easements that were placed by the state over the property. And um, that, that does not, they're, they're not related. They, the, the residential densities are not related to the, any conservation easements that were placed on top over the property. And is there any way to explain, you know, there's been differing opinions and different things that we hear that that is almost impossible to remove versus no, it's simply a process. Can you opine? I can't give an opinion over whether or not or how the state is going to, to fall on this or rule on this one way or another. Um, but conservation easements can be amended with the proper, under the proper procedure that the state can, can do. Theoretically, just speaking hypothetically, to throw one thing out, theoretically, if there is a easement over uh, the area for a go gopher tortoise habitat, I mean, the state routinely permits for gopher tortoises to be relocated. Um, it is not an absolute. This is statewide. This is not just limited to, to Apopka or to Central Florida. Uh, but one of them could be to relocate the gopher tortoises to actually an area, especially if the final product of any type of redevelopment and amendment to the PD would be to, the, to designate current portions of the golf course land which have a residential land use, if those are then designated as conservation land use. In theory, the state may accept the relocation of any gopher tortoises that are found to a new conservation um, area that would have a conservation land use, which would then, that would govern any type of development to be done pursuant to the state, to the city's comprehensive plan and land development code. I don't know. I, don't, I, don't have I heard seven thousand dollars a turtle, but that, that's the that's current true. price. It's mm -hmm. gone up from yeah. twenty five hundred to four, and now it's seven. Okay. At least for the time being, until new new mitigation banks are. I'll do it for place. six. <laughs> <laughs> um, one other question: If the swap happens and the HOA and the citizens decide we want to make part of the golf lands conservation, can they? designate that that way and then use part of it for recreation? Or do they have a say-so or does it all have to be the same? No, that would be, that's when, ideally when you're opening the, the PD for amendment, then um, one of the things that I would actually counsel this council, the city council and staff that any amendments to the PD are gonna be accompanied by a fully executed developer's agreement which a, will outline in detail the proper densities, the number of units allowed, minimum lot sizes, and then also outline all the permitted uses within the boundaries of the PD. So under a conservation, if, if theoretically there's a conservation land use, then that would define what would be permitted in the conservation areas. I have worked in past in other jurisdictions which I have been counsel to. Um, conservation areas include complete um, natural growth meaning you can't put a lawnmower in a conservation area. The conservation area means conservation. It is ideally natural native habitat allowed to grow and conserved in its original natural state. If there's a recreational land use, then you could dictate this is the amount of acreage for recreational use. Within the recreational land use, this is what, we, what could be permitted. Passive parks, active parks, golf course. That would be something which would be presented, um, not necessarily negotiated, but it would be presented for the city council to approve. So this developer's agreement basically outlines 
every permitted and non-permitted use within the boundaries of your PD in an agreement that is executed by the owners, approved by the city, and that's, that's your zoning. Um, the city does, this isn't novel. The city does this all the time with other planned developments that have been recently approved. The city approves planned, the developer's agreements which dictate and outline all of the permitted uses and they're clear. Um, these are documents, I think, I'm now blanking, I think these are documents that are actually recorded in the public records as well. And that is, that would be one of the benefits to finally, again, quote unquote, cleaning up the PD. So you wouldn't have to rely just on the figures on an overall site plan map. It would be accompanied by an executed agreement which will clearly define all of the uses on the site. So um, then we would have, the city would have before it for approval X amount of acreage for recreation, Y amount of acreage for conservation, within recreation will allow this, within conservation will allow. The density will be, again, as we've discussed, probably the preferable. Um, density would be an overall two to one. That would mean there is, acreage is X, density is Y, therefore Z are the total amount of, lot, the total amount of units permitted, permittable within the boundaries and then those units will basically, which would be whatever is additional above what's already built and approved there, um, would be dispersed or constructed in, in such a way to accommodate um, their, their viable use. So in theory, that does not necessarily mean um, 51 acres equals 102 units, but also doesn't necessarily mean 400 additional units. It's going to really be what the final figures are going to show and what the density will allow that to, to accommodate and that's something then the city must review and will review and approve or deny pursuant to the comprehensive plan and the land development code. So if the PUD is opened, development agreement is an ironclad protection for the future use so that the citizens here don't ever have to worry again, are we going to have an apartment built in our backyard? Now, once, once the development agreement is entered and approved, then development has to be done pursuant to that development agreement. Any type of changes would then require an amendment to the development agreement, which means it coming back before the council, back for public hearings, the public will have input, and then it's for the council to decide as long as, and, and, and your decision is going to be based and shall, mandatory shall, shall be consistent with the comprehensive plan and the land development code. Commissioner Smith? You, <laughs> this, the, this, the silent giant here. <laughs> Uh, to the uh, city attorney, uh, you mentioned in the event that the golf, golf group swaps the golf course for the 51 acres, that the plug could be reopened <coughs> and then reevaluate uh, whether or not it's going to be one acre or two homes per acre. But you're taking out the 301 acres for the golf course. So do we have any idea as to what the acres would be left? And how many homes then could be built on the 51 acres? Let, let me, let's, let's, Dave, David Evans kind of has been working on that a little bit. Let's let him try to answer that. And... Do you want to do it? Yes. Yeah, that's good. Uh, we have done that calculation. So what we talked about uh, in a couple of different scenarios was to take the total overall residential land for Rock Springs PD, 1,142 acres, and subtract the 300 acres of the golf course and then subtract the area of land within that leftover piece that already has the residential, very low suburban uh, designation of two units per acre, and we came up with about 700 acres, plus or minus. So if there are 700 acres of a residential estate, which is one unit per acre left over, um, and you add another unit, that's 700 units available. The property on the 51 acres varies, um, but with a, a product that works for the economics of the golf course swap, um, we're talking about 300 to 350 units on the 51 acres. Townhomes. Okay. Any, any other questions, Commissioner Smith? Oh, okay, good. Well, Mr. Well, Becker. Just, uh, since that was the most immediate thing said, townhomes would require a comprehensive plan amendment to get past the two dwellings per acre beyond, because everything north of Poncan 
would preclude that unless we made an overall increase in dwelling units per acre in that same area, correct? Not necessarily, because it's because the comp plan encourages cluster development. If the overall acreage, um, let's say in theory, if, they, if what 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 they've the number they've thrown out, so um, strictly hypothetical for discussion purposes, I think the current amount, the current units within the PD as permitted are thirteen hundred thirteen hundred and forty. One thousand three hundred thirty-seven. Well, the, what's what is vested? It's, it's say thirteen thirty-seven, and I believe thirteen twenty twenty have been built. Right. So that is based on the mixed the the fact that there's a mix of one to one and one to two. I get. Mm -hmm. So if we remove the golf course, let's remove the golf course. And now we have what we have remaining is eight hundred overall acres less the golf course, let's plus or minus. Mm. If we take the acreage, if we take then the remaining 800 acres and change the land use designation to two to one. For the so now you have two to one at for 800 plus or minus acres. That means then that there would be a permissible density on the site of 1,600 units. So you take then the units that are already, and, and any change in the, let me clear, any change in the land use designation is not going to affect any of the property rights that the current homeowners have within, P within the PD. There's, there's no change. Um, because an individual unit, unless one individual unit owner, and this is on the extreme, decides they want to build a second home within their lot, that's, that's the only way there would be any effect to, to what you currently have as your rights to your property. So remaining, and again, speaking in extremes, with 800 remaining units, if you change the overall density to the entire 800 to two to one, you would have density permissible at 1,600 units. So that's where you have then, if there's 1,300 built, whatever you get that excess entitlement that, you, that you've gotten by amending the land use plan to, to accommodate mm -hmm. the extra density. Um, now, how you place that density is as long as, it's a unit is a unit. A townhouse does not have is not equal to units because it's, it's a townhouse. A unit's a unit. An apartment complex, uh, an, uh, an apartment building in theory is 300 units. The, 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 yes, it's more dense because in theory you build, it, you, you build an apartment complex within three, acre, let's say a three acre lot, you can put in 300, um, 300 units because that's your high density based on the acreage. But here we're talking about 800 total acres and then the, the, the uses that would be permitted within that acreage if you accommodate the land use. So yeah, I, I whether it's a townhouse or a single family home, it doesn't matter when you're looking at it in the purposes of density. Yeah, the point that I was making though is in our current comprehensive plan and the current land use and designations that are within Rock Springs Ridge, it's not guaranteed that there's going to be even two dwelling units per acre on the entirety. That would come before council for approval. Right, you would have That's to make point. I don't want to. Mm -hmm. I don't want to live in the world of what what might be versus what's reality currently. And the way that our current code is written, and the designations within that within that community, that would preclude there being townhomes or apartment multifamily types of residential within that location, currently, because you cannot build multifamily on a residential estate or residential very low suburban land use designation. Correct, except Correct. that a, that's, 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 all, that's uh, the point that I was making. But di 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 differentiating what would be multifamily use and single family, um, these are still, if they're deemed single family uses and, and these are the units, um, it's going to still be based on what your density <clears throat> is um, or what the density will be presented before this council to, to approve or, or deny. But the fact is, and again, we're getting outside the, the, what I thought the scope of this workshop was going to be. So. If, if we're talking just a land swap scenario where uh, the golf group and the HOA decide to do a swap of the 51 for the 320, all of that's gonna have to come through the normal hearing process for us to contemplate anyhow. Yes. Um, what I was more interested in is why we were here to begin with, and that was really to contemplate this whole idea of a land swap, Harmon Road primarily. Um, and so I just kinda wanted to take a step back, and again, a lot of the people here, if not most, were here in April 
where the idea of doing this tri-party agreement land swap was presented as a, you know, it was administration led with the idea of even the city owning it for a period of time and doing the precisely the things that you described as wouldn't be really legal um, to change our PUD document and make fixes as, as we, as, as it was, as it was called. And so we've gone from almost pro to now, am I hearing it correctly that the, the staff or the administration is against doing anything with Harmon Road as it relates to Rock Springs Ridge? My understanding is that because there's never been any type of formal offer, or sorry, not, an, not necessarily an offer, but there hasn't been any formal action to put the Harmon Road property up for sale. So there's therefore no formal action for this council to consider, and hence why it's never been brought to a council meeting. Um, unlike the other properties that the city has sold, the airport FBO, <clears throat> as well as the Sandpiper property where the staff brought it forward for authorization to put it up for sale, and then the authorization and a vote to accept the highest bid. Uh, that's never been done for Harmon, so therefore um, any but how could we have How could we have made that representation on April 27th to this group of people? It was presented yeah, during that meeting. I mean, that, that was the course of action that the administration was taking. My, so understand, how, how my was that understanding understanding is that that was a option to be considered um, and, and one of the options to be considered. Now, um, we're here today in November and the situation is such that um, the, the direction that I've been given um, is basically that there is no formal offer to put Harmon Road up for sale, to accept any offers for the Harmon Road property, and bearing the situation that there have been unsolicited offers to purchase the Harmon Road property for amounts that are in excess of the appraised value, and that appraisal is still, val uh, is still valid. I think we're still within the time frame for it to be a valid appraisal. Um, that it would not, it would at this point, um, at least I would advise and counsel the council to consider whether or not that original proposal of the purchase of the Harmon Road property at the two point at the appraised value, when considering those, that is then something for this council to consider. And at this point, it's really a business decision on the part of this council. The, the, legally, well, there's nothing legally. It's it's at this point, it's your you as stewards of the city to determine whether it is a good business deal or not to, um, to what bid you want to accept for the Harmon Road property. In our latest discussions and our final discussions with, the, uh, with both the golf group and the HOA, because we have presented these new circumstances, these unsolicited bids, that the original proposal for that price was going to be something that was, could be potentially untenable and, and hence Either there has to be an, a, you know, a competitive price for the property, or the other option is that they conduct a private swap um, between the 51 acres and the, the golf course. Also, one of the things to bear in mind, back in April, um, the 51 acres was never in place. So that was not something that could even be contemplated because it was never something that was, that was presented. That was a recent development which provided an alternative, um, an alternative that could possibly be of, of great benefit for the city and for the city's taxpayers. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> so I struggle because it sounds like there's been some contemplation of this 51 acres prior to tonight. You know, that you've contemplated developers agreements, you've contemplated uh, what could be done on that property. We've never formally discussed that. Um, so I, I guess what has transpired between April and now um, for us to, how, how does it gotten to where it's at? Because again, even with the Harmon Road swap with the HOA, it's gone from two and a half million. We got the the uh, proposed agreement prior to this meeting. Then we get this one from Mr. Artiman. That's the one prior to the meeting was two point five million. That's since been uh, taken out. So I don't know what the best amount that they have available on the table. So there's a whole bunch of fluidity to this thing. That from where I sit, I don't know what's heads or tails. It's not, and I you know I feel like I'm a smart person. Um, some would argue maybe in this room, but why is there so much fluidity on this thing? I mean, is, if this is a 51 acre swap within HOA, the HOA, what business does the city have anymore at all? 
Well, and that so, was, that, it, it, and it, then why is it not just subject to that? Now, I, I, I tend to agree with some people in the audience that you've got three different external parties that are going to have a say on that 51 acres. You're going to have the Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission. You're going to have uh, the gas company. You're going to have Duke Energy. Uh, all that have easements on that property. So it's not as uh, cut and dry as we discuss up here tonight. But where do we sit? <laughs> Well, it, if, if, if I can just re respond um, kind of on two points. Um, one, you're, you're not alone in seeing that there is fluidity because in my own dealings with both the HOA's council, it, it has been fluid. Um, and, and we think we're going one way and then they have presented another um, proposal and another one and, and therefore it, you're not wrong. It is, it, it is, it is fluid. Um, the city's position has always been the same. It's, it's um, you know, at this point, Harmon Road is not officially up to, for bid, and that's done. And secondly, um, I wouldn't necessarily use the word, the, the term contemplated. Um, the discussions that were made were similar to any other developer that would come before city staff and discuss what options are available for a property. Staff can always discuss, here are the options available to you as a developer. That does not necessarily mean that the city has contemplated and this is what the city wants, this is what we'll agree on. It is basically just as staff would treat any other developer who would come, or any property owner for that matter, mm -hmm. um, who would come to the city and say, well, hey, I, I've got this piece of land, what can I do? Well, you can do this, or you can do that, or we can consider this, or we can consider that. Those are the types of discussions that were had and not necessarily, and not that um, this is what's going to be done. In order to redevelop the property, it, it's, it's plain as day. There has to be a land use map amendment and there has to be a, an amendment to the PD. How that's accomplished, that's still open for discussion and open for hearings. But the bottom line is that's what has to be accomplished. So there hasn't been anything considered or contemplated on the part of the city. It was merely here are the options, here is what is going to be required, here is what the city will review. So um, I don't want it to necessarily be characterized that, that staff, um, to an extent, has basically said, this is what you're going to do, and this is what we're going to prove, because that never occurred. That's not what happened. Um, I had one more note. Uh, so again, during the last city council meeting, I was, the workshop is only beneficial if we kind of check all the decisions that we need to make as it relates to Harmon as well as this other business. But, you know, the first decision there is whether or not we want to put Harmon up for sale. And one of the things that I had asked for staff interpretation was, do we have any use or planned use for that property? And I don't know if anybody's able to answer that here tonight. Um, um, we, we do need an additional um, water plant because of the growth in Southwest um, Apopka. So would we need both pieces no the, the smaller piece would probably work and you know we could probably put the tower on there if that that's something the city council wants to do we wouldn't need the 23 acres and and just so you know i just we just got a uh an up update on the appraisal and just the 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 bigger piece the 23 acres where the tower is we got an appraisal of 2.9 million dollars uh, that just came in late yesterday afternoon um, so we got a $2.9 million appraisal on the, that would be the north side of Harmon Road. And so, uh, Mr. Mayor? Just, just the north? Yes. That's the 23 acres? Correct. North or south? No, north. The north. north. I've seen so, so, sorry, south, south. <laughs> I'm sorry, south. Yes, 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 yes. South. Who did the appraisal? Same company that did it before. And do they do the appraisal at the best use? Yes. So that would be on an entitlement of max density multifamily? Yes. I mean, I'll get this to you um, tomorrow. I'll get it in, as, as an email to everybody. Because as part of the, so again, I, maybe it's just from where I sit, but I'm not contemplating where water, water reservoir, water treatment is going on these properties. I don't sit in my commissioner seat and contemplate those things. So I don't think it's up to the council to decide that. I think it's staff recommendation to say we need to use this property for this purpose and happy to contemplate that when it comes before us for a vote. Um, but the, the communications tower that was in the packet in preparation of this workshop, yes. from how I interpret it, and maybe I interpret it incorrectly, but it looks like it still has useful life. It's still in working, operable condition. 
it's not in any imminent uh, danger of, of failing or uh, something that we should be concerned about. So it's not like we have to move that thing anytime soon. Would, would agree, but okay. but if you could get, you know, let's let's say that that three acres or whatever that those, the, the guide wires take up, if you got another million dollars for that, I mean, is it, does it make sense? Listen, it's still up to city council to determine whether we want to move it, or do we just replace it there? Are we, you know, the other the other position was, do we go to to fire station six? We haven't brought it to council. I mean, all those three options are are available. We can we can leave it there and and you know. Obviously, the useful life is, is getting short, and the report that uh, Rob put together is, is I think, pretty uh, comprehensive. Uh, we can leave it there uh, until it, you know, it, it, uh, it's met its useful life. How many more years we've got? You know, the thing is we don't want it to fall down and then have a problem with our, our first responders' communications. So then the question is, do we want to put it, leave it there? Um, and, yes, it will be a savings somewhere around $700,000. Do we move it um, and, and do we generate more revenue from the property if we sell it uh, by moving it to, 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 uh, to be able to pay for the additional buildings that go with it? I mean, that's all, all to be determined. I, I just, and the only reason I put this in here, I thought we're, we're, we're talking about everything and so I wanted everybody to have all the documents that were, were, were available. The only thing I, I wish we'd had were the FWC and somebody on, we were hope, hoping to have them on a Zoom call, but. Obviously, that's not possible. So we're gonna we're gonna try to get some 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 a little more concrete um, uh, opinions from FWC as to the the turtle conservation land and what we can do there. And one so, one last question on something that was in the packet, and we haven't really discussed it here, but I just wanted to get clarification on it. So the engineering study for the phase one. Um, RECs are recognized environmental conditions. So on page six sixty three of the packet, just help me understand it I have six in case I'm asked about it. So the findings and opinions section, section seven, each one of those three observations talking about how the land has operated as a golf course for 17 years, oh. there may be hazardous substances on the subject property. One, item two was talking about the golf course maintenance area, um, external fuel receptacles, things like that. All three of those observations end with a sentence of something similar. It says, you, uh, the engineering services considers the historic operation as a golf course and the application of agricultural products to be evidence of RECs. So all three of those observations talk about considered or evidence of, but then in the conclusion section, section eight, it says this assessment has revealed no evidence of any RECs in connection with the subject property. So am I just misreading that incorrectly? Can someone help answer that? David or, or Tucker? Uh, the, the valuation and the environmental reports um, have to clearly state how the analysis was done and what the findings are. Um, in their summaries, um, what they're trying to measure that against is the normal level of um, environmental contamination that would be expected for a piece of property that would have intended use. So I think what you see is that they've, they've evaluated it based on the first paragraphs, the first three comments, and, and, and note what things they found as they did their observations, but none of those trip the thresholds of something that would be, um, uh, require few, uh, uh, further observation. So you understand in the, in the phase one environmental survey, if they do find uh, contamination or something that needs to be evaluated further, they do a phase two. And so in this case, they're not recommending a phase two evaluation based on that comment. Okay, because I'm like the, the third one just says the historic discharge of agricultural residue is considered to be an REC. So basically, if I interpret your words, the sum of those three parts did not sum up to a threshold that met from a conclusionary standpoint that it was REC. Correct. Okay. In, any other? Oh, Commissioner I, Smith? I have one other comment. Uh, our attorney stated that once we took out the golf course land, that is approximately 800 plus or minus acres of land left. And should we re-amend the PUD to two acres per acre, to two homes per acre, uh, that will come to 1,600 homes. Then if you subtract the 1,320 that's already built from the 1,600, that only leaves 280. Correct. Then if we use the figures that the engineer gave, he said 700 plus or minus at two acres, two homes per acre, that's 1,400 homes. 
And if you subtract the 1320s already built, that only leaves 80 homes. So neither one of those figures come to 350 units per acre. And should that amendment take place, does the 51 acres get entitlement to all the additional development? We cannot divide and parcel out the overall PD because it's the overall PD. So we cannot look at the 51 acres just in a vacuum. The 51 acres are part of the overall 1,100 plus acres of the PD. So when you are amending the PD, you're looking at basically the four corners of the PD, its acreage, and then what is the, the density. Now, all these numbers that are being bantied about today, they're all hypothetical. What is truly going to be decided is what is presented to this council as part of an application, and whether or not those numbers as presented are consistent, are consistent with the comprehensive plan and the land development code. So we're really, right now in, in discussion of numbers, we're really in generalities and, and hypotheticals. Um, it could be that, it could be less, but in the end, what is to be truly contemplated and voted upon, that's, that's where you know, the rubber meets the road. That's where we have to do, the, the city staff must do the review, and that application must be consistent with the comprehensive plan and the land development code. So, it, it's not necessarily accurate if I'm gonna say we're gonna carve out what is currently has a one-to-one -one density and then use that acreage to come up with the totals because in truth, there are lots right now on that one-to-one. -one. And the way that the land use map was drawn within the PD boundaries, you really can't carve off, this lot is two-to-one, this lot is one-to-one. -one. Unfortunately, the, land use, the land, future land use map lines split lots in half. And you have some lots, 67 per two-thirds of it is two-to-one, one-third is one-to-one. So that's the way that the land use map was drawn. And, and, it's, and it, that's not something that's, that's just unique to, to Apopka. It's happened here. I've been in other jurisdictions where land use maps are drawn um, and they accidentally split lots with lots with two different densities, two different land use map designations. Um, so that's why it, it's got to be careful in, in how we, we, peer, we, we piece things together. I think the easiest illustration is we take the overall acreage and the overall acreage that we're going to use for residential use, designate what that density is, and then that's the amount of lots that can be built, that, that those are the amount of units that can be built within that acreage as consistent with the comprehensive plan. What that number is, that's what applications and submittals are for. But does all those lots automatically go to that 51 acres? In theory, it, not necessarily. <laughs> Commissioner Bankson, any other final questions? Okay. Commissioner Velasquez, final question? Um, the only thing I, I just want to say, the tower, um, it's not on its deathbed. It is viable. The only thing that that tower cannot do is to add any more uh, servers, I guess, uh, add another uh, uh, telephone uh, uh, company to it. It is working fine, we do maintain it. It does just need uh, some sprucing up, uh, but it is not on its deathbed. And what happens is that, that you know, me? on the social that media, me? that's how they were kind of defining our tower, that it was, it, was, it was on its last leg and it had no use. But at this point, we're not anywhere near uh, having a piece of property for a new tower, nor do we really have a number of how much it's going to cost to take it down or to build a new tower. So at this point, I'd like to just stress, because that's something that I did speak with IT, um, it's not on its deathbed. It is something that is viable. It is used by our first responders, and it will remain there until we have something else, and that's not anywhere near the future, in the near future. Okay. Any other final questions? And we're going to bring up the Esther group to just kind of give you a real quick update on you know, some, some options maybe they, they have if, if, if the Rock Springs Ridge HOA can figure out a way to, to uh, acquire the, um, the golf property. 
So, David, you want to come? Yeah, come on up, please, sir. Um, They keep saying that the, the tower is on its deathbed. Uh, good evening, and uh, thanks for your time. Uh, my name is Dave Essler. I'm a golf course architect. And, uh, yeah, you think after listen, I, I might have picked up on that. Um, <laughs> but I'm not that bright. Thanks for your time. Uh, and before, I, I will be blissfully brief. Um, but I think the mayor staff, the council, should be thanked for providing this forum so that, uh, you know, government obviously isn't easy, and it's certainly not uh, simple, but at least it's out in the open, and uh, they should certainly be credited for, for providing this forum so that there's nothing happening in the back room. Um, my name is Dave Essler. I am a golf course architect, developer, and golf course contract. Contracts. This is my partner, David Fairman. We're both from Chicago area. Um, we both have an extraordinary interest in this particular property. Um, we think that golf is a viable option at Rock Springs Ridge. Uh, we think that the physical capacity of the site is quite good, uh, if not extraordinary. And we uh, are, are, have been following this project for better than a 10 years or so uh, since the golf course closed nine holes at a time. I grew up in the area and uh, played the golf course early days when it first opened and, and just think that it's a shame that uh, although you are not alone uh, in, in seeing a golf course in open space close, I've been very impressed by uh, the Rock Springs Ridge board in trying to avoid litigation uh, and, and do this relatively peacefully. Uh, we, we've looked at a lot of deals where it doesn't go this cleanly and it, it may in fact not ever become a golf course again. That's a possibility, but the, the board should certainly be um, proud of the work that they've done so far in, in pushing this deal forward. Um, and we've been impressed because David and I have looked at a, a large number of these deals and um, while tempers flare, from time to time, uh, I, I think everybody probably in this area has, has a collective interest in seeing the open space preserved and uh, zoning and economics um, should see through. So that's all I have. David, anything? <clears throat> Does this work? I, I feel funny uh, having my back to you folks, so I'll try to speak to the group. Uh, Dave laid it out. We are. Um, working at, together and looking at different sites. We currently have a letter of intent in on a piece of property in Chicago, which is sort of like this, but they're all different. This is a failed golf course, 27 holes, that does not have homes on it. So what was to be done with it? We're working through that. I happen to be uh, a keen observer of things that you're going through right now. I have been a... Uh, property, a golf course property developer, manager. I have been a, a golf course lessor and a lessee, and uh, I'm familiar with all these issues. I also spent the better part of 25 years in a municipal setting. So it scares me, uh, Michael, Councillor Michael, but I think I understood most of what you were saying there. Um, <laughs> but I think that was a very technical, and uh, for those of you keeping score, it uh, was an interesting conversation. My, my sense was that there's still... <laughs> If there's interest, and, and both sides, all people are to be commended because the number one enemy of these deals is inertia. And you've got some momentum going and some energy going, and I commend you for doing that. And I know it can be brain damage, especially if you're just listening and don't really care all that much about the details. But I think there's, I think there's a light at the end of the tunnel here, and we're interested in exploring it. Now, obviously, we're not prepared to put anything in writing and tell you what we would do, but the basic concept of what we would do is bring a more modern concept to golf, not top golf, but some of those things that are more practice oriented and more short uh, time constrained issues so that if you wanted to, if you only had a limited amount of time, you'd be able to accommodate, you wouldn't have to play 18 holes or nine holes for that matter. That's the concept we're working on in the Chicago market, whether that's right for this or not. The point is we like to be outside. We like to be on golf courses. We're uh, like bad pennies in the golf business. We keep coming back for more. So um, 
thank you for the opportunity to speak. And uh, we're interested and we're willing to follow along and see where this goes next. There's clearly some next steps. D David, can you just real give me three minute snapshot of one of the, the, the deals you've done the last two or three years, just kind of like how you would work with a, you know, sure. somebody out of Atlanta or, you know, Chicago. Sure, this is in a Chicago market. Okay. Uh, I, for those, I, I don't know if you know my resume. I worked for a company that was in the golf course ownership and management business. We had properties in New Jersey, Florida, Wisconsin, Illinois, Colorado, California. Um, and uh, the, the company that I worked for uh, is a wealthy family out of Chicago, and they decided in 2014 or so they didn't want to be in the golf business, so I've sold all those. After that, I got involved, you know, the, the blush was kind of off the golf market for a while. It's kind of coming back now. But after that, I personally own a golf course now, which I have right-sized. I had a 50,000 square foot clubhouse that was way too big. It was old school golf. Uh, we had a hotel associated with the property, and those have all been offloaded, sold. And I can tell you I'm leasing that golf course to a golf course operator under new conditions and the property is turned around. It's gone, it's been a very good story. So we're not here to waste your time. We are here to try to help. And I think that's our, our um, major uh, opportunity for both sides in this group is to kind of give you some experience. And if you wish, we'll give you our opinion whenever you want it. And uh, so that, that would be the, the side I'm looking on. The other ones we're developing now are, I would, they would be confidential right now. They've asked us to be confidential, but we are um, sort of not a global management company, obviously. Uh, we have those skills, but we're interested in sort of more rifle shot things and uh, fixing things where they can be fixed. Thank you. Well, thank you, David. And David, we appreciate it. Well, I hope you got some good information. Uh, maybe some of the, the, the folks here, the city council and some of the attorneys and and uh, the other uh, other folks will be around to ask you if you have any questions real quick, and then we'll get out of here. I know these mosquitoes about to drive us out of here. So anyway, thank you everybody for coming out. I hope hope it was worth your your, your time, and you got some information that you can take back and, and share with with your friends and neighbors. Thank you.